A great artist was once asked, what is your finest painting? His response was, the next one. I'm sure that every communicator of the faith feels that way about his next message. I certainly feel that way about what God has given me to say today. It's in response to what I believe is the deepest need in most Christians and in many churches. Hear God's word from the 13th chapter of Acts and from the 24th chapter of Luke. And God raised up David for them to be their king. And he testified to him, saying, I have found in David a man after my own heart who will do my will. And then in the 24th chapter of Luke, the exciting result of Jesus' appearance to the disciples on the road to Emmaus. And they drew near to the village where they were going. And he indicated that he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went to stay with them. And it came to pass, as he sat at table with them, that he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Did not our hearts burn within us as he talked with us along the road, as he opened to us the Scriptures? I pray that God will bless this reading of his word and fill it with his grace and power. Let us pray. O oh, gracious God, reach inside our hearts and fan the flickering embers of our coldness into a white flame that we can give warmth and inclusive love to others, that we might be radiant Christians, contagious, winsome witnesses. Set us aflame, Lord, and make us the fellowship of the burning heart through your flame in us, even Jesus Christ, we humbly pray. Amen. Recently, a friend of mine confided that in the days that he was considering the Christian faith, when he would attend church, he heard people talking about being born again. He thought that they were saying that they were bored again. Well, that uh, describes how many people feel about their faith. There probably was something wrong with his hearing and not the experience of the people who spoke. And yet, if we were honest, for many of us, the Christian faith, traditional churchmanship, the phrases of the creeds and the traditional ideas can become faithlessly familiar and eventually be the source of a blandness and a boredom. When people write to me, asking their questions and sharing their needs, so often they say, why are Christians so dull? And why are many churches dull? Or why is that committee at church the dullest thing in the world? Or why, when Jesus Christ is the most exciting person in the world, do people make him so dull? That's the question. Why are Christians dull? Why are many churches dull? We wonder, what happens to people that they become dull? Is it because they were dull people before they became Christians? Or was it that they got dull after they became Christians? Now, there are a lot of dull, stodgy people who put the Christian caricature over them and they're still dull inside. But I've found some happy pagans who, when they became Christians and put on the straitjacket of traditional Christianity, that they became very dull people. The wonder of what Jesus Christ can do in our lives is that he can maximize us, help us to pull out all the stops, and play his music at maximum 
in each of us. That happens when our hearts are filled with his grace and power and love. God said of David that he was a man after his own heart. That means that he followed God's heart, that he had a heart that uh, reproduced God's heart. Now, we know all about David's failures and sins, but we also see David dancing before the ark out of sheer praise to God. There was nothing dull about David, and it was because of the purpose of his heart, the passion of his heart, the person of his heart, which was God. He wanted God more than anything else. And even when he failed, his longing was to get back to God. Create in me a pure heart, O God, was his persistent prayer. Now, when Jesus appeared to the men on the road to Emmaus, he gave them an experience of the burning heart. Now, the heart is the mind, the emotion, and the will. And what happened to those men touched all three dimensions of their life. And they were able to say as a result of his appearance to them, oh, how our heart burned within us as we walked with him along the way, as he opened to us the scriptures. Now, I believe that there are several basic things that this scripture gives us about how to move from dullness to a bright flame. When I looked up the meaning of the word dull, I discovered that it means that which is blunt. A knife can be dull. Its point can be dull. But dullness is also lack of intellectual perception and discernment. It's coldness of emotional response. We speak of a light being dull when it's dim. Or we speak of music being dull when it doesn't move us. Or a sound being dull when it's muffled. Jesus took those dull hearts of those men and enlivened them to the place that they were vibrant and alive and dynamic. The first thing he did was that he himself came to them. That makes all the difference in the world. The reason that Christians get dull is that they lose that dynamic relationship with the living Christ. Dullness is the absence of the indwelling power of Christ. Christ is aliveness. Christ is light. Christ is vitality. Christ is enthusiasm. I believe Christians are supposed to be the most interesting, the most exciting, the most attractive, the most contagious people in all the world. And it happens only as daily, hourly, moment by moment, Jesus draws nigh and comes to us. The source of a dynamic Christian experience is Christ himself. But note that Jesus came to them as they were with what they had. They were discouraged. They had witnessed the crucifixion and had heard about the resurrection, but they were discouraged by the fact that they did not know what had happened to Jesus. The point was they had not experienced his resurrected power. As they walked there on the road to Emmaus, their feet were like lead. You see, Jesus had come and taken the world off of their shoulders. And then suddenly, as they experienced his crucifixion and the cruelty of man to him, the world was put back on their shoulders and there was a dull ache in sight of them. And Jesus came up to them. He appeared to them especially for those dull hearts. And he asked them about themselves. It was like he said, how are you? Are you all right? Is something wrong? Where are you hurting? What's troubling you? That's the way he does it. He gets inside of us so that the real person inside our hearts, the thoughts of our minds, the emotions of our feelings, and the responses of our wills might be touched by him. 
He doesn't take us for granted, ever. He gets inside of that heart of ours and talks to us about the real issues. So often, we bypass what's really going on inside of us. I think that the reason for dull pulpits is that pastors preach sermons that don't really reach the needs of people. We skim right over the heads and hearts of people talking about irrelevancies when people are aching inside. It'd be the same as if you and I were to meet personally on the street and I said to you, how are you? And you said, oh, fine, when you were aching inside. There would be no relationship, no contact, no intimacy. The antidote to dullness is dynamic delight in allowing Jesus Christ to get to the real issues. What are they for you right now? Those broken relationships, those memories out of the past, those unrelinquished plans for the future, those things that you said that you wished you hadn't said, the things you wished you would have said that you didn't say. When Jesus Christ comes to us, he comes to the real person. That's what he did to those men on the road to Emmaus. He said, what is troubling you? What's the matter? Why are your hearts dull? And then they said, are you the only person in Jerusalem that doesn't know about what has taken place? And they recounted to him all that had happened. And then they said, and we had hoped that he would be the one to save Israel. And then Jesus helped them to understand who he was. He opened to them the scriptures. Have you ever thought what it might be like to be at a Bible study with Jesus and to have him take the Old Testament and go through page by page describing the red royal line of preparation for his life and ministry? Take, for example, I think that he led them back to the five books of Moses, the Pentateuch, and he helped them to understand that he was the Passover, the lamb, the scapegoat. And he helped them to see that everything that God did in the sacrificial system was in preparation for him becoming the once never to be repeated sacrifice for the whole world. And then I think that he led them into Isaiah and help them to realize that he was the Prince of Peace, Emmanuel, the suffering servant. I think, for example, he would have pointed to Jeremiah's reference to the fact that he was the branch of righteousness. Or perhaps he led them over into Amos and pointed out that he really was the plowman catching up with the reaper, bringing both righteousness and justice. He was Obadiah's deliverance. He was the turning again of God referred to by Micah. He was Habakkuk's anointed one bringing salvation. He was the Zerubbabel rebuilding the house of God. He was the one who was the son of righteousness. Everything that the Old Testament said in preparation for the coming of the Messiah was exposed that day along the road, and their hearts burned within them. Their dullness was cured by a realization of all that God had done in and through Jesus Christ. Intellectual convictions change the condition of our feelings, and then our feelings fire our wills. So very often, people want to have good feelings. They want to have their faith be just a montage of feelings. But Jesus Christ doesn't deal that way. He doesn't touch the feelings and leave the mind unconverted. He changes our minds by helping us to understand who he is and what he's done for us. And then that controls the feelings. I put it this way. There must be fact, a response of faith, and then feelings, and then follow through. And if you ever get those things out of order, you're in trouble. Now, there are dull Christians who are very emotional, and there are dull Christians who are stoically intellectual. 
and there are dull Christians who are volitionally obedient. What he does is to put the whole thing together and give us an experience of the totality of his love for the totality of our being. Notice the next thing that happened. They said, my, our heart burned within us. The Greek word cardia is used here in the text, and it's singular, meaning that Jesus Christ took the two hearts of those two men and brightened up the flame to white-hot brightness and then galvanized them together. I know of no Christian who is dynamic and alive, who doesn't have a small band of people with whom he meets consistently to share the faith, share his needs, and pray. Christian fellowship is an antidote to dullness, for we begin to see ourselves in relationship to other people, and trusted friends can say that we're getting pedantic or stoic or hard or judgmental or negative or out of sorts or lacking in power. We need the fellowship. But note one thing further. They had to go to Jerusalem and tell the others that Jesus Christ was alive, that he had been raised from the dead, and that he had come to them, and they knew that he was there with them. In the inner heart, they had received a touch of faith, a new capacity, a new relationship with him that changed them into the most exciting people. Can't you imagine them running along that same road back to Jerusalem? I can just imagine that they stopped along the way and said, do you realize what's happened? Christ is alive. He's with us. He's defeated death. My, how our heart burns within us. And then they had to go to Jerusalem and tell the other apostles that Jesus Christ was alive. The way to cure dullness is to share the faith, no longer to depend on convincing people of theories, but to share our life. When we know Christ personally, our life is lived at maximum. We no longer are uninteresting, unimpressive people. Suddenly, people want to be with us. Now, let me ask you the question. Are you a dull Christian? Check that by answering this question. When's the last time you felt the touch of Jesus Christ in your life, setting you aflame again? When's the last time someone asked you, what's the reason for the hope in you? Why are you the way you are? I'd love to be the way you are. Has anyone asked you that recently? And have you sensed the fire of his intervention in some experience in your life? Have you sensed that he knows about you and understands? Well, the one thing we have control of is that heart inside of us. And what happens in there is so crucial. Remember that the heart is the mind, the emotion, and the will. And therefore, we can pray that wonderful prayer that was put into a lovely little carol. And it says, into my heart into my heart. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today. Come in to stay. Oh, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. If you really pray that, you will be a member of the Anti-Dullness League, no longer a dull Christian, but a part of the fellowship of the flaming heart. <laughs>